Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to this book launch this evening. Um, my name's Jasmine, I'm from Carcanet Press and I'm just gonna run over some housekeeping um, before we get started properly. I'm really, really pleased that you can join us to launch Kitchen Music by Leslie Harrison, which is super exciting. Um, I'm really pleased that we're launching this amazing book together this evening. Um, just some stuff that you need to know before we look, jump in properly. Um, tonight we're going to be together for about an hour. Um, please find the chat box, say hello to us, let us know where you're watching from, um, let us know what you think of the reading as we go through. Please make sure that when you're using the chat box you've selected everyone on the drop down menu, otherwise we won't see each other's messages. Um, what's going to happen is um, Leslie is here, she's going to read for us. While she's reading I will have the text up on screen for you so you can follow that along as a visual guide. Um, you can reconfigure the layout of your screen so have a play around um, and if you need to change it to suit your needs you should be able to. If you have any tech problems or questions about that drop them in the chat and I'll do my best to help you while we're going through the event. Um, we're also joined by John Glenday, who is going to be in conversation with Leslie after the reading, um, and then there will be time for him to put your questions to her. So if you have any questions for Leslie, please find a separate box. It says Q&A on it. You can get your questions for her lined up in there, and John will be able to put them to her later on in the event. Um, so thank you for paying your two pounds to be here. We really, really appreciate that. Um, if you are in the UK or Europe um, or the Commonwealth, anywhere else, um, you will get a discount code um, to buy your copy of the book, which I'm putting in the chat for you. It'll come as well as an email. Um, we are not the American publisher of this book. So if you're in the States, please go to New Directions and you can have their lovely edition of these poems. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here. We appreciate your support. So uh, without further ado, I'm very, very pleased that we're joined um, by John Glenday, who is the author of four collections of poetry, as well as recently a limited edition art book called Mirror, which came out from coast to coast to coast in 2019, um, and a recent pamphlet from the Mariscat Press in 2020 called The Fur. Um, also in 2020, his selected poems was published by Picador. So if you don't know his work, you should definitely go and check it out as well. Um, but I'm very pleased he's here and I, um, would like to invite him on screen to begin. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, Jazz, for that uh, introduction. And I'm delighted to be here tonight because I've known Leslie's poetry for some time. And I feel she's one of the most uh, innovative and interesting poets writing in, in the UK today. And I'm really grateful to Karkinet for being perceptive enough to, to bring out this collection, this, wonderful collection. Um, if I was to, to link Leslie's poetry with any others, it'd be quite, it's quite difficult because she's, she's, as I say, quite an individual writer. I think the way that she addresses the natural and historic world in her poetry with this intimate clarity and, and respect reminds me of, well, another, another of Karkinet's poets, Thomas A. Clark, um, whose wonderful selected poems, The Threadbird Bear Coat, came out, um, I think it was a couple of years ago. Um, others, um, Jen Hadfield, perhaps, it reminds me of, and that uh, Westry Arcadian poet, uh, Lydia Harris. Um, the, their poetry, not similar, but addresses similar themes. I'm fortunate to have known Leslie for some years now. Um, when I was living in the Highlands, she was also living in the Highlands, though in a more distant part. In fact, all, Leslie always seems to live in distant parts and small places and uh, hankers after coastlines, I think. Um, when I moved back to Angus um, uh, some six years ago, Leslie's also living here now, just up the coast from, from me. And um, so I feel there's a geographical link between us and her writing, and I'm really pleased to see her adding to that tonight. Um, she's the author of a number of really interesting pamphlets. Um, she's been shortlisted for the Callum MacDonald Pamphlet Award and also won it on another occasion with her pamphlet Ecstatics, where she 
was in collaboration with the artist Laura Draver. Uh, she won that in 2012. She also had a collection out, Disappearance, in 2020. What fascinates me about Leslie's work is there's this remarkable juxtaposition of the far-flung and the parochial. And I use parochial in its most positive sense, you know, who was it said that our deepest emotions are always the most parochial? Um, but her poetry is never far-fetched and it's never cosily domestic. She's a poet of, as I said, of the utmost restraint, um, always maintaining a respectful closeness to her subject matter, if that makes sense at all. Um, the other thing I love about her poetry is it ranges so widely. Um, she's really inventive in that respect and, and comprehensive. She incorporates the visual arts into her poetry. She has in, indeed um, images embedded in the poems, which reminded me of um, um, W.G. Sebald and um, Saffron Four, what he does with his novels and, and putting images in, in with the text. Um, there are found poems in this collection. There are fragments of historical documents, handwritten drawings, and music. Music plays a huge part. And in her fascinating introduction to this collection, the novelist and short story writer Kirsty Gunn points out how these poems, among other things, are a form of music. They're also vital citations of history and character, natural world and gender. And, and what Kirsty says in her introduction, I'll just quote it now a little bit. The infinitesimal care taken with the use of white space works as both stave and bar, treble and bass. From girl to woman, to whale to water, Harrison shows us that it is female, the energy and presence that is inside those sea songs and stories we already know. So I'm delighted now to pass you over to Leslie, who will read for about 25 minutes. And remember to grab your copies of the collection with your uh, discount and post your questions for Leslie in the chat box, and I'll put those to her. Over to you, Leslie. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, can everybody hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, it sounds great, Leslie. Oh, great, thanks very much. Like I said, I'm not the most techy person in the universe, so it's nice to hear a voice at the other end. Um, thank you very, very much, Joe, for that uh, introductory place when John said he would um, uh, join with me and um, join me this evening. So that's a real compliment. I've been a great fan of John's work for years and years and years. And uh, so it's nice to be together tonight. Um, I'm going to read um, four poems from um, this collection from Kitchen Music. And um, when Jasmine said, and we will also put um, the poems on the screen so people can um, see them too, I thought, oh, that's actually great because it opens up a whole new set of possibilities. And um, you'll know if um, a poem is arranged in a very particular way on the page, they're um, uh, impossible to read aloud or they sound very strange and very halting. But um, I've taken advantage of the fact that you'll be able to see it as well as hear me um, read it. And um, so a couple of the poems, um, I hope I'll make sense when um, you see them written on the page as well. I wouldn't normally select them to read out loud because, you know, they don't um, have continuity and they would be very stilted uh, just to listen to with um, the image. But I will start with the very first poem in the book, Wu as in Wound. And um, this poem was written in my head years and years ago, but I never quite found um, the way to confer it to the uh, to transfer it to the page. Um, years ago, I went to listen to Capella Nova, um, a vocal group, sing uh, this piece and other pieces as well in um, a church uh, up the hill town in Dundee. And from that church and amongst all this, I think it was actually a bomb site. It didn't look like it had been, um, any work had been done for the last 80 years in this place, but there was a beautiful church in the middle of it. And uh, when they sang this piece, 
um, Wu as in wound is a, a part of the instruction to the singers uh, in John Cage's Litany for the Whale. And um, the whole piece is um, the singer spelling out the word whale. And uh, so it's a call and response piece, but Capella Nova chose to sing it by walking around the church at the same time. So they were coming in and out of alcoves and they were up in the gallery. And it was absolutely hair raising because there was this beautiful piece of um, uh, call and response work up on the edge of a hill, looking out over the mouth of the Tay, which is kind of the shape of a whale, and uh, looking out to sea into the North Sea, where the whalers from Dundee uh, would have gone. So, um, so this is my uh, riff on the instruction to um, the singers on how to pronounce um, the letters of the word whale so that they're consistent there. So, woo as in wound. Woo as in wound. Ha as in hunt, ah as in raft, l as in fall, e as in breach, woo as in bow, ha as in tump, ah as in slight, l as in blink, e as in swell, woo as in fluke, ha, as in tongue, ah, as in ebb, l, as in oil, e, as in jaw, wu, as in run, ha, as in calf, ah, as in I, l, as in blow, E as in breath, Wu as in sound, Ha as in hull, Ah as in wash, U as in shelf, E as in dive. The second poem is one that um, is definitely impossible to read aloud without um, seeing um, how it's written on the page. And it comes from um, my reading of um, the Trenaby papers, which are kept in the Orkney archive. And lucky for me, the whole thing is digitized now. And what I was interested in was seeing how many uh, mentions of whales and references to wheels there were in the archive and of course you can do all that just at the click of a button and so it generated this fabulous list um, of places associated with the word whale and uh, when I was looking to see why um, whales were mentioned um, it really brought to light all the places in Orkney um, where there was a shallow beach where the pilot whales could be driven onto the shore and uh, as well as the places where a whale had just washed up where there'd been a whale wreck and um, so I made um, this next poem, Can, out of um, the, all these place names. And um, so, as you can see, uh, the poem is just a series of mesostic uh, mini poems that are made up of all these place names. And the whales are uh, being driven north, if you like. These are all moving north. And they start to intrude on the official record um, of um, these things happening. Um, and when I uh, was going out to visit a friend in Dearness in Orkney, um, all of this, just when I was in the process, um, when I was on that trip up uh, and was visiting the archive and I went out to see her in the evening, I came around the corner um, of this beach and the very next croft at the end of the sandy beach was called Grind, which is the, a fairy wheeze and probably a Shetlandic and uh, a wider name for um, this process, the grind of driving uh, the wheels up onto the beach. And there it was, the name of a croft. So this is just a nice opportunity to get this, um, to give this poem a bit of publicity, because unless you had the image in front of you, um, it would be very difficult for me um, well, to read it or to talk about it. So um, that was quite eerie to associate the actual um, driving of the wheels upon the beach um, with the place. It all came to life just as I um, was reading the archives and driving around Orkney that time. So. So that's can, and a number of the um, poems in this book do use this visual layout, but that's the only one that um, I'm going to read this evening, I think. 
other than a little bit of um, Hailioto, the next one. So Hailioto, I was at a, um, a conference in um, Dingwall, it was, and um, it was about um, the sea and different ways of framing the sea and different ways of um, sharing knowledge of the sea. Um, it was arranged by um, UHI, University of the Highlands and Islands, and they were, um, I think the theme was that um, there should be more cross-disciplinary um, study and discussion. And so um, I was the only poet there, so I think there should have been more of us, I have to say. But there was one um, speaker there, and she was talking about this island of Hailioto, which um, is in the Gulf of Bothnia. And uh, I found her talk just astonishing because um, that whole area um, is on isostatic rebound, so it's rising out of um, the water. Um, almost visibly after the last ice age and in a uh, living memory, not within one person's memory, but within um, the duration of folk memory, if you like, over a few hundred years, this island had risen out of the sea and had slowly um, been occupied by um, animals and birds and then by people. And now because it's suddenly there out in the middle of the water, in fact, it isn't so much, it's almost joined to the land. Um, it's a navigation hazard, so it's very electrified with beacons and electric lights and all sorts of things. But I thought um, the fact that um, there were memories existing of times when the island was much less accessible and much more of a almost a submerged barrier, um, I thought was just astonishing. It was like watching the beginning of Genesis or hearing about people that had been there to see the, um, that whole bit. So um, I uh, started tracing um, the island um, to try and reimagine how it had risen out of the water and what you could see. And so um, I got a contour map of it and uh, I presumed that the tiniest contour, the highest one, was maybe the first bit to come out of the water. And then um, just by following concentric contours, you could see it start to rise in pieces. So this poem, um, Halioto, um, does have these drawings interspersed with it just to illustrate this um, process in a kind of time-lapse um, photography thing. So. I'll read Helioto. Thank you. Not light, not dark. A blank North Ocean, too far for birds. A catch on the horizon. Chilled enlightenment of crushed grey green, the sudden extrusion of a crest. A Humboldt current drawing up the cold, the sea uneasy, querulous and dense, the sea slow upwelling, the sky an open eye. Daylight unworded, like a film left to run on endless loop, the old seabed brought up into the air, exhumed, exposed, the wind unrhymed, rough at the edges, the wind a song, no music. Grass grows, a faint effort, almost hum, as bays become lakes, lakes become swamps, swamps become meadows, blank, brackish sponge, fastened to each other, uterine and beading, eel pout, lugworm, fungal and beetle black, true wretches of the sea. At Marianaimi, the pilot station, black against the sky, its wooden ribs still sprung. Long strings are installed, tuned to its resonant frequencies. All day the building sings to itself in tectonic calm, A sharp and G. A faint tinny gamelan, octaves blooming over hours or deforming as light or wind declines, like that part of the inner ear whose thin hairs can detect a note, even at great distance. Um, on YouTube, there's a, a clip of um, this musical instrument, if you like, that's been installed at the pilot station. And um, a guy has just a uh, strong, I think it's piano wires, just across the rafters. And then the resonance of the building, as it, um, I suppose, as the wind hits the side of the walls, um, brings the notes out. And it's the creepiest thing ever. And I thought, wouldn't that be fantastic if we all had those in our lofts, in the lofts of our houses, just so you could hear um, what the sound of your own house, the actual sound of the place, just to make that into something that was within our range of hearing. So 
I'll speak to the joiner, see if that's possible in my cottage in a committee, but I'm sure he'll just shake his head. Um, I'm going to um, finish with the beginning of uh, the long poem, Roses. Um, I love Halder Laxness and I love this book, Under the Glacier. It's one of his shorter books and um, it made me laugh so much. I don't, I think it was written with humour, but a very understated humour and uh, quite often um, the the very human twists in it, not just the bits that are humorous, but the very human twists you don't realise have happened until afterwards. It's a very um, understated way of thinking about the world, which I loved. Um, and so um, there was a part um, in the book that I've quoted here um, where um, they have a discussion about this uh, woman that's come back to stay in the village. Um, the village seems to be uh, populated by old bachelors that just fall out with each other and constantly argue or you know not and uh, and then this woman comes back that was there when she was young and she's obviously and um, gained mythical status you know in her absence and um so that uh, whole human drama made me laugh but um the thing that really made me think about was uh, the way that he managed time and how over a long period of time nothing really happened but it had to be given um, that time in the novel in order to um, unfold almost in real time to make you feel like you'd lived um, something with the characters so it's a, a lovely lovely book and um, so I'm just retelling one of the uh, stories as if it's a script but a play almost. So this is from Roses. All afternoon the sound of grass, cyphery, frivolous, and leaves like bits of paper whirled by the wind in flurries of days and minutes, green and fallow brown, summer into autumn. One, morning, the door stands open, the chilly bleat of seabirds fills the open house. Milkweeds blossom in a stank of turf, the cattle knee deep in yellow grass, the sun behind them. Clouds are motionless. Old John, freed at last from practical desire, tending his cabbages as his world turns around him, stirring in old flesh and fur and mouldery leaf clumps rotted down, their sweet ancient smell released, and thrift, cudweed, wild thyme that bloom and falter on their own. The horses, grown out of the ground, shoulder to shoulder, tasseled with moss and turd in medieval browns and faint gold leaf, earthy, earthly, almost constant, sweating slightly from their journey. Two, time passes. Everyone is ageing in the moment that it takes to turn the page, now child, now adult, now old man, rain swept and serene among these rank, warm creatures with her soft tongue clicks and lipped hisses, rubbing and snorting round him, his mouth forming words as he slices the greasy yellow moss, spooning in steaming rounds of shit and straw while the mountains grind down and the world goes past behind him. Ua, bussing and flurrying, unpacking her suitcase by the light of a single bulb as the floor creaks and mutters. Appearing briefly, now here, now there, now framed in the window, lit like an angel in the cold white glare. Later, sleeping, she fills the room like a deep sea mammal, sighing and turning as the fire glows orange, then grey. Or the glacier, remote as the moon, on the high, on the high plateau, its pale flanks sloping steeply to the tree line where small lights are sometimes seen. Evening, fog dissolves into dust and soon only white birds are visible, gliding without effort like snowflakes drifting in a calm or falling asleep inside a book, the words merging into darkness, the white spaces gliding out. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Leslie. That was wonderful. I, I found it particularly moving, um, the, the whale poems. I mean, the, the, there's, a, there's a thread of 
discomfort in me when I listened to them because I think I told you my great uncle sailed in the Dundee Whalers. Yeah, that was a great story. (laughs) So I actually, I loved Who Is and Wound because it gives the, puts the breath back in the whale again. I I, I love that. And in Cain, how the text is grounded in the epigraph. It's 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 a remarkable thing to to do in a, in a in a work of poetry, and it was so good to be able to see it on the screen to see how it works. That mesostic poem, how how, how, it, how it functions. Um, I thought that was that that was a remarkable um, a remarkable reading. Um, and we'll ask a few questions. Um, I'm still waiting to see if we'll get any questions from the audience, but I've got a few I want to ask you. And and I suppose the first one is, how did you come across that title? Um, I've been carrying that around for ages, just waiting for a chance to use it. It was from um, a radio program um, that I heard years ago, and I'm sure, I can't find it now, but I'm sure the program was about um, Appalachian fiddle music. And it was um, used for that um, body of work or that kind of music that started at the back door at the kitchen uh, with people arriving and joining in and singing along or playing together and maybe verses being adapted for more recent events or being primed on the spot. And then when that, um, when the music moved to another house or was taken to another place, it would then, um, you know, change to its new circumstances. It would alter every time it was played or um, or with the new audience to respond to the people that were listening. So it's just, um, I love that phrase just to describe that whole body of, um, whether it's music or storytelling or just folklore, the stories you tell about your family that um, moves around with you and changes every time you retell it um, and, resp- and responds uh, acoustically and also in content to the people that are there in the room that you're telling it in. So That's lovely. I love that. Um, I mean, the other thing about the reading was it was the first time I've been at a reading where someone's talked about isostatic rebound. So thank you for that. <laughs> and, and also, the, the, the thing about Hilo Otto, the poem, are those illustrations in it. Now, you drew those, is that right? Um, I traced the contours, yeah, on a 1 to 25,000 map, I think it was, yeah. The, the poem actually finishes with the Landsat image, uh, which is, when you juxtapose it just with the outlines, um, it's quite um, startling just because it's so... Um, machine produced and you suddenly realise how technology has taken over something that um, just rose up out of the water. It's suddenly a very um, a technological place, what with its wind turbines and its antenna, all these things that are marked on, but also with the precision that the island has been drawn, you know, every nook and cranny and every strip of the road and every hole that's been dug. And you realise it's become a, a manufactured place. You know, that's that, you know, you internalize that image now when you think about the island. So rather than something that's grown up organically. So interesting to compare. Yeah. And the words and image work particularly well in that poem. I think I love the way the the, the, the island grows as the poem progresses. (laughs) There is an intriguingly close relationship between the visual arts and text in your poems. you know, in, in kitchen music, you've got Joseph Cornell's mentioned, uh, mm-hmm. Ronnie Horn, Callum Innes, and um, Marina Rees. So can you tell us a little bit about how art works in, in, in your writing, how, how it enriches your practice, in other words? Um, I think it just reflects the way that we work as human beings. I just was looking for kitchen music, the, that poem itself, uh, and I've got at the beginning Joseph Cornell's um, quote, collage equals reality and reality in capital letters. And I think that's how we create the world for ourselves. It's a collage of, you know, what you take in from all your senses, from your memories, from, you know, the way you make stories out of things that you see in order to make sense of them. So I think um, comparing any meaning on anything is a process of collage. It's how we assemble our lives to make it meaningful to ourselves. And um, it's very, I like, um, I spend a lot of time uh, in art galleries or looking at art books because it's so interesting to see how, um, it's a very accessible um, way of seeing how somebody else has framed something that you are also looking at. So you really are getting, you know, 
quite easily into the mind of, or I find it a very accessible way to get into the mind of somebody else that is also looking at, um, whether it's Ronnie Horn looking at, you know, water um, sources in Iceland or um, Kalaman is looking at uh, watercolours in Oslo. It's a, a very um, immediate way of um, making it fresh again for yourself and um, maybe being in multiple places at once or seeing it through multiple eyes you know, helping yourself uh, step out of your own fixed mindset or preconceptions or just realising that they're there all together, so. Yes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. it just seems that you're remarkably open to mm -hmm. art, music, the the music of history, if you like, you know, looking at archival notes and, and it all seems to grow in your poetry in a quite organic way. I, I think um, you have to be, um, I think you have to be um, open in that way. I think I know in, in order to um, to learn about um, where you are and all the different voices and all the different ways of looking and all the different layers of occupation that you know exist at the same time. You know, it would be a false way. I've always shied away from um, writing poems that you know say I think this, I see that, I am the figure in the landscape because. It's quite a conceit to put yourself in the middle of that and make meaning of a place stemming out from yourself, being you know the focus of attention and everything being relevant to you. So I shy away from uh, fiction or anything else where it is um, it starts to read like a monologue after a while because um, uh, the landscape, if you like, or the place you live is multiply occupied. Everybody has their own. Um, meanings that they um, impose on the place. Everybody um, perceives that you know through their senses or through their memories or through their understandings in very different ways. And we have to be aware that all these meanings and all these ways of living this place um, exist at the same time. So um, I think, you know, it's, a, it's an act of honesty in a sense, you know, to step back and not put your own single point of view uh, front and centre, but, you know, to be aware that, you know, you're one of many, many hundreds of voices, many of which, even though they're historical, are still present because they've left an aftermath behind them, like the whalers, you know, that's, there's still a presence there from these people. There's, there's very much a sense of respect and discretion in, in, in your poetry, Leslie. And I was smiling at your answer there because at one point you said something like um, you didn't like to be at the centre of, you know, you didn't think in the centre. Because knowing where you live, you know, you live on the very margin of Angus, your house hangs on a cliff over the North Sea. I we're going to see the margins of society there and I thought, <laughs> oh, there's nobody from here tuning in this evening, so, although, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm very, very lucky. Um, uh, and I don't think I could ever live inland. I did. Um, I had a job um, when I was a student in Canada for four months, and I was away up in the Rocky Mountains. You know, a beautiful ideal landscape, and I was incredibly claustrophobic the whole time, just because I thought, how do you know which is east and west? You know, how do you know where the sun comes up? How do you get your bearings? Um, and so I've always lived on the coast. I think it's maybe it's something to do. Maybe you agree, John. If you grew up near the coast, then you're always looking for it. You take your bearings from where you know, in the morning the wind's coming from or, yep. you know, it always colours the light in the sky in a, a way that, you know, makes you aware of where you are on the planet in a sense. So yeah, very much. it's a bit disorientating when it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a question here from Michael, I'll read out to. Uh, he points out, I used the word grounded when uh, I, I was talking about the, uh, the poems. Um, this is Kai and, you know, it's sort of rootedness in geography, history, and biology, there's a complete outward focus, yet there's something very personal about the poems without a self-exposing subjectivity. Real evocation, real praise. How do you write yourself out of it mm. or into it? Uh, um, that was very astute, because um, when I am writing, um, uh, the first draft is the one that I then um, go on to erase myself from as much as I can. You know, if I, even in your notes, if you if I've got the first person, I this or I that or my the next thing, you know, I, when I go back over to think, how will I use this? Will I use this? Um, that's the point where I think, do I absolutely need this? And so that is um, the first person rarely appears, I think, in the poems uh, because I 
because I've actively um, rubbed it out or deleted it. And also because I, uh, I don't want it, I can't even think off the top of my head if I've written any first person poems recently. I can't think what they are if I have, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I don't, it goes against my instinct, you know, to make a final statement about what this place is or what this subject is, you know, in a way that would imply that as a final statement and other views are excluded and logically or in some other sense. So mm -hmm. I'm just one voices of many, I think, you know. Uh, I've got a question here from Michael Rover who's asking, are there particular poets that you think are influences on you? Uh, well, present company, obviously, John, I've got, you know, your entire collection on my mantelpiece, um, as you know. Um, but uh, as well as yourself, um, you mentioned um, Thomas E. Clark, very interesting. But, um, we, I remember we had this conversation a wee while ago, and um, I like, uh, I've gone back to Les Murray a few times, his translations from the natural world, um, because I absolutely love the way that he, he completely gives himself into um, language. You know, he uses the, was it Roland Barthes that talked about using the whole muzzle, you know, when you're talking, all, he, he's a uh, language to do with um, animals is very lush, very automatic. To pay it. Um, so I've gone back to there for uh, many tutorials on how to use that kind of language in my work. Um, at the moment, I'm going, I'm reading A.E. Stalling's um, poems. I'm about to be here somewhere. Oh, yeah, it's the afterlife. It's afterlife. That's a crack in it book. And um, I'm really um, in awe of how she writes so effortlessly using um, a, a formal layout, using um, a form, because um, it's something I've always, always struggled with. So um, I'm reading a lot of um, her just now in the hope that subliminally something, you know, will sink in, but I really am in awe of her. And uh, what else am I reading at the moment? I would say I read a lot of John Burnside. I went through a very deep John Burnside phase for a while. I think I'm at the other side of it now because I feel that I've gone on a journey with him and um, it's left its mark. So, but I still um, read all these new work when it comes. It's very interesting. One book that I found really, really interesting, and I just realised just now that it's a crack in it, book two, is Nicholas Barker's Visible Voices. That's a great book. I've had that on my shelf for years. When did it come out now? Was it 2014 or something? 16. And um, he, I go back to this book a lot for um, uh, another tutorial about foreign because he talks about how um, forum and poetry is so closely interlinked uh, with the printing, the history of printing. And um, he talks about, especially towards the end, about um, uh, less or more experimental ways of uh, laying um, poems on the page um, were only possible or only became uh, much more popular when we could do these things in our spare bedrooms on our laptops or when you know, technology enabled us to do this for ourselves without being, but then, um, of course, there's a big historical precedent for these things. But um, I go back to that book quite a lot um, to remind me that um, you have to justify the form of poems too, you know, um, there's a reason, there has to be a reason why you've laid it out in this way or why you've made it that shape. You know, that's as much of the meaning. You take a meaning from the shape of things on the page as much as you take from what you hear and what you read. And um, so that's a really useful book. Uh, there's a quote, a quote by, um, oh, what's the name of Henry Moore? And he said, uh, when he was asked why he made these massive reclining figures, he made little small ones and he made huge, big, enormous ones. And his reply was, every idea has its right physical size. And I thought that's perfect. You know, some things are a haiku, some things are 14 stanzas, you know, yeah, there has to be a reason for these things. So, so Nicholas Bark really clarified all those thoughts for me as well. So, mm. That's interesting uh, how you, you said that the poem was to justify its shape. Mm. And one of the things I love about the collection is, is that shape, it's the, the acreage of white page there is in, in so many poems and how you, you, you're you not frightened of that white space. Um, what, what part do you think that plays in a poem? Well, um, it's something that you, you know, you really do have to justify. Um, in the Alice Oswald, actually I read a lot, um, she in one of her 
um, collections. Uh, at the end, she actually meters the white space for you. She's got seconds down the side of the page. And so she's actually orchestrating how this poem will be read by the second. So um, that she's very, very clever about um, how she um, uses the white space to make you um, breathe and to let you, the audience breathe and, you know, to let ideas, you know, um, assume the shape they need to take in the room, you know, in the space between you. Um, so um, I think it's perfectly justified um, as long as you don't, sometimes I think am I pushing my luck here? And one of the poems, uh, uh, Whale Songs, I think it was, it was an erasure poem. I used um, uh, the music of the spheres. And um, if I had been honest, then there would have been pages of whiteness. And then there would have been a page with a few words and then another two pages of whiteness and then a bit more. But I thought, no, I, I'll never get away with this, you know. But uh, so I did condense that. A bit. Um, but I think it's perfectly justified. It's, um, you know, the white space is there for a reason. And it's um, it gives space to, you know, the ideas that are contained within the words. But um, I can see that it's uh, sometimes these things make more mean more to the poet than they do to the reader. So you always have to I think, be conscious of how it's going to, how much patience people have at the other end. Um, I, I think the reader will be equally um, enriched by these poems, Leslie. Um, I'll go back to another um, audience question. This is from Jenny Lewis. Um, and Jenny writes, you mentioned John Burnside, whose poem, The Fair Chase, was commissioned by, for Radio Scotland. Your poetry is also full of music and sounds. Have you written poetry specifically for broadcast ever? Oh, well, um, I've certainly um, written um, to go with uh, music. I worked, with, I don't know if it's ever been broadcast. It's on YouTube. I don't know if that counts. But um, we, uh, I worked with Catherine Wren from the RSNO. She's a, a viola player. And also um, with Alex South from the Royal Conservatoire in Glasgow. Um, and uh, they um, started to put um, music uh, to whale songs, it was actually, and um, we performed it uh, with me um, speaking uh, as if my voice was one of the instruments that came and went, you know, within the music. And uh, we performed it in the fish shed in our broth, which was great uh, because um, they were, were right on the edge of the sea um, uh, playing this music that reflected um, tunes that um, travelled down the coast. You know, they were taken by the whalers or by fishermen and they reappeared in Shetland and then they reappeared in um, parts of Iceland or up in Norway. And uh, they were, were right by the sea. And uh, as luck would have it, um, when we gave the performance, um, it was a lovely day. And so the fish shed, it's like an old it's like a garage, it's got these garage doors all along the side and if a boat comes in this side they'll put up this garage door and if the lorry's on that side they'll put up this garage door so the fish can just be cleaned in one door and out the next. Um, but of course there was no fish gutting going on when we were there but boats were still coming in and so the audience were sitting in the fish shed and there was this music and me reading poetry about boats and whales and boats were coming past and people would just you know wave to the boats and the whales and the boats would just wave again and it was such a beautiful thing it was a lovely thing but um, Alex and Catherine are um, very used to um, playing in caves or in uh, various um, outdoor venues and so we've got another um, couple of um, uh, dates coming up in Aberdeen will be playing indoors this time um, at the uh, Wayward Festival and uh, we're planning another thing for October which um, uh, will be further north in Shetland, I hope it happens. Um, but I think it's a lovely thing to do um, to take um, your own voice as an instrument as well as the instruments outdoors because I said, I remember saying to Catherine, what if there's a noise, what if it's windy and the doors rattle or what if an ice cream van goes past, you know, what then? And she says, oh, we'll just incorporate it into the music because that's the music of the place. All these sounds are part of the sounds of the place. Are are we today? And uh, it just magically worked. It was so nice. So This yeah. sounds like another form of kitchen music, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, complete with fish. Yeah. yeah. And there were those, that fish shed in our growth is chronic to have some piano wires strung across its rafters, you know. There we go, I, yeah. I uh, here's a question from Jenny Lewis, um, which is just saying, what a wonderful answer, thank you. Oh. And it is a wonderful answer. And, it's, and I suppose another question I want to ask you, Leslie, is you've travelled a lot in your life, you know, 
there's poems here about uh, the, the, the Swedish Finnish island, uh, Greenland, the, the Orkneys here. One of your pamphlets, I think it was One Bird Flying, is you in the footsteps of Marco Polo crossing mm -hmm. Mongolia. Mm -hmm. What is it about travelling and how does that um, impinge on your poetry? I think um, where um, I am just now, I'm just, uh, uh, as you know, just on the east coast here and right on the sea, you're aware of, you know, the weather coming to you from a great distance. Um, you can see where I am, you can see, um, you know, storms coming up over the north horizon and they'll have started in the Baltic or sometimes we've got a really harsh wind coming in from Siberia. We see the boats going out and when you... Uh, Follow where the boats have gone. Now we can do it on the ship tracker and things like this, and we can see they're heading up to you know Swedish islands or, uh, and then you know for hundreds of years we've had connections with um, the North Isles and the, out to Iceland for the fishing and then the whaling. And so I think there's maybe it's more apparent when you're on the coast, but yeah, yeah. Um, I certainly feel that um, you know we're part of a vast, vast wave. The world, the, the wide world, impinges on us just slightly. You know we're at the edge of it. So something much faster, you know, a whole sensory world that's much faster than you know, what one might think. And so it's quite interesting for me, you know, to go to the other side of it, to go to the places where the whalers might have arrived at and see if I feel, you know, I can see uh, our growth or Indy or feel its presence somehow, you know, on the horizon on the other side. It's it's a, a very interesting way to, um, you know, establish where you are on the planet and to feel um, the reaches, you know, of your view of the world. Or, um, and I think it's also, um, it's a real education as well, just to see, um, you know, where you do find that the, you know, the people from where I am have left an impact or a footprint in some sense, um, you know, so far, you know, around the curve of the planet, it, it's quite sobering to realise um, uh, the reach of your, um, you know, the effect of your presence, you know, how it can be felt so far away. So it's a, I think a, a, a good thing to go and just place yourself somewhere around the curve a bit so that you um, you do get a sense of, you know, the shape of the world and, you know, your place in it somehow. It's another way of grounding, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting because you were talking there about um, the, the travelling gives you that idea that you're part of something vaster. And I actually think that's, that, that's what the white space on the poems does in part for me. It makes me think that the text here is part of something much faster. There's something that's mm -hmm. not being said that I'm being invited to access myself. You know, that, that's very interesting. Um, I'll ask one last question, actually, and it's um, what are your plans? Where do you go from here? Um, I am. Um, well, I'm going to. I'm, at the moment, I'm exploring. Um, or I'm just seeing whether I can find it possible to write in a, a in a accepted form. Uh, I'm reading the Stallings, as I said, and I'm looking to see um, if that's something that I can do. I've set that as a challenge to myself. I don't know. Um, I would I would like to hope that I could, but I can see that um, it kind of goes against the grain. But that's not a bad thing, you know. It's good to have a. It's good to um, to frighten yourself a little bit sometimes, you know. So. Um, uh, I'm also um, looking, um, I'm going back to Nicholas Barker actually, and looking again at um, layout on the white page and just to see how far I, any of my poems can be stretched in terms of layout. Um, when um, uh, he's got some great examples in there and I'm following them up and I'm in contact with a couple of the poets, the poets that he has been in touch with where um, they've used um, uh, layouts that are radically different, that are more drawing than writing, or where they've really pushed um, the boundaries of what writing looks like so that, you know, when you're looking at this um, uh, poem on the page, um, you know, you question whether it's, is it still a poem? Has it gone on to being more of a, a visual image than... Um, a poem itself, even though it happens to have a few words in it. Um, so that really interests me as well. And the scoring also really interests me. When I was working with um, Catherine and Alex, 
um, when uh, they were improvising around the words or when I was um, offering words around a piece of music, um, they would score them, but they used graphic scores as well. It wasn't a stave with a treble clef and things like this. And I thought that's so interesting because it really um, shows that um, sound um, is a much more organic thing than, you know, I was led to believe all these times, you know, I was looking at songbooks in primary school with, you know, rows of music and the words underneath. So for me personally, that's... Um, that was a revelation and I, I think there's a lot more for us to do together there or for me to learn about there so um again it gets tricky because um you think how i was so pleased when um uh, the publishers could get the poem can into the right shape and size to get into a book because i never thought i would ever see a book i thought that's you know that's the wrong dimensions altogether. So I was very pleased to could get it into there. So um, there's a balance as well between them doing things for yourself and then doing things, you know, that you want to share with the world that's in a manageable form that, you know, people can pick up and put in their pocket. So we'll see, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Well, we'll look forward to what comes next, Leslie, but uh, I just encourage everyone again to, if you haven't got a copy of Kitchen Music already, you need to go out there and, and, and buy one. Uh, and Leslie, thanks for that wonderful reading. And uh, I'll pass back to Jazz now. If there's no further questions from the audience. Mm. Thanks, Leslie. Thank yeah. you guys so much. Thank you. And congratulations, Leslie. Um, it was really cool to hear you read those poems. Um, and thank you for hosting, John. It was great to hear your conversation. Um, and thank you guys for being here and um, supporting everything and for your great comments in the chat and your brilliant questions um i did put the link and the code for you again in the chat so please do go and buy yourself a book um buy one for your friends unless you're in america in which case buy it from new directions um if you can't find the chat and, or you don't know what's going on then you can um check your inbox tomorrow because it'll come as an email um, and if you have any difficulty getting hold of the book just get in touch with us and we'll do our best to help you as usual um so i think that's everything um the last thing is uh, please join us again next time. Um, this time next week, we're launching a new book from Rebecca Goss. Um, it's her new collection, which is called Latch. Um, details are in the chat for you, um, where you can also go to our website and sign up for our mailing list so you won't miss any events and stuff like that. So that's everything. Um, congratulations again, Leslie, and thank you. Thank guys you. Very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>